we bring to you our first panel discussion of the day on a very, very interesting subject. May I request all of you to please be set for our power pack panel discussion on eyes in the future, making India next healthcare innovation capital. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all our panelists. Please put your hands together as I present to you Mr. Om Manchanda, Managing Director, Dr. Lal Pat Labs. Please put your hands together as each of them join us on stage. May I also present to you Dr. K. Madan Gopal, Senior Consultant Health, Niti Ayog. A round of applause, please, as I extend a warm welcome to Mr. Sandeep Makar, Managing Director, Johnson Johnson India. We welcome you, sir. May I also present to you Dr. Santosh Shetty, Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director, Kokla Ben Ambani Hospital. A round of applause as I present to you Mr. Ayan Dev Gupta, Co founder and Joint Managing Director, Medica Hospitals. A round of applause as I request each of you to put your hands together as I welcome our moderator, Mr. Amor Puri, partner, consulting Deloitte India. And as we look forward to a very, very engaging session with all our experts right here on stage, I'd like to tell our audience that the last 10 minutes is what we have kept for all of you. So to make sure that this is an open house, to make sure that we have thoughts coming in from you, please feel free to ask questions, share your inputs, and of course, we look forward to each of you taking this forward. All yours. A very good evening to all of you. Uh, it's an honor uh, to moderate this uh, panel today with the esteemed panelists. I think the essence of uh, uh, this, this summit, uh, but more importantly, today's topic is to look at how to make India the healthcare innovation capital, so to speak. Uh, it's a fairly wide brush, but I think it can be very well examined by looking at three core aspects. Right? First of all, what is it that is beset? What is the necessity for innovation today in the healthcare delivery system in India? Uh, second of all, what has already changed? Uh, what will continue to change? And more importantly, layer it with what is the view of this panel in terms of what more needs to be done in India today? I think the healthcare industry has moved from strength to strength. Uh, you know, sometimes slow, sometimes at, at, at a very robust pace. But I believe the, in the last two to three years, the biggest in, intervention that has happened has actually been more than one. Uh, as undesirable as it was, you know, not just for us, but globally, uh, it did two main things. One, it challenged the assumptions of our healthcare delivery system. Two, it's also led to some tectonic shifts and some mega trends that have come through. And while there'll be a host of them today, I just wanted in my tribute to touch upon just four big mega trends to kick off this. I think the first you all will recognize is that COVID-19 uh, was a game changer in terms of awareness of everybody in terms of lifestyle management, right? So COVID-19 was supposed to impact people with comorbid conditions adversely. So it not only the person who was concerned, but his entire family gained an elevated level of awareness. 300% increase in terms of searches on the internet for prevention, for management, you know, for fitness. That's a very, very big deal when you start thinking about the kind of research that people are doing today themselves in terms of managing their own, whether it's lifestyle or whether it's clinical conditions. You also look at the internet penetration at the same time, which is happening on mobile devices. So, you know, people are now accessing information more easily. And as dangerous as it is to think about what conversations are happening on the internet, as many people are answering, asking questions, there are more number of people answering those questions. And outside of the medical fraternity, I like to believe that's dangerous. But the point to take home is that there is this elevated level of conversation that hasn't happened before. Uh, and that is tremendous. When you think about the way this awareness has come about, you know, it leads to prevention, but it leads to the second mega trend that I want to talk about, which is digital engagement. There are industries today that about four to five years back did not exist over an extremely negative. Let me give you an example. Uh, mobile healthcare and fitness apps. Today, that industry is almost going to be, and let me get my numbers right, right? It's almost going to be 4 billion in the next three years. And virtually five years ago, it was non existent. You think of e pharmacy, it's currently at about 25% of the urbanized retail pharma, and in the next four to five years, it's expected to be close to around 50%. You look at teleconsultation, we have about 750 e hospitals with about almost a billion dollars worth of teleconsultation services. 
You think about the value that has been created in the last four to five years alone, and you realize it's more than the growth rate, what legacy companies in the healthcare service sector have been seeking. And that's something to take away from, I believe it's here to stay. The third mega trend I also want to speak about is the delivery pathway. And clearly, you know, the providers on the panel will, I'm, I'm sure, have a lot to share. But what has really happened is, while we have a demographic dividend, there is also a geriatric population. There is also overcapacity, or rather lack of capacity in the provider space. The burden of healthcare has largely been borne by the private space. And therefore, healthcare at home is already $8 billion going at 20% year on year, which is again tremendous. Now, when you look at these three and you look at the private participation, one cannot ignore what the government has perhaps done. Clearly, there is going to be argument to do much more. But at the same time, I just, I also wanted to touch upon a few topics. The healthcare expenditure in India as a percentage of GDP has doubled in the last four to five years. It's at about 2.1% already. Excellent as it may be in terms of the pace, it's still underwhelming compared to some of the global benchmarks when you start thinking about 10%, 12%. And the NCD or the, or the burden that India has clearly much more needs to be done. If you look at PAIR, for example, there is NDHM, there is, you know, the Ayushman Bharat. But clearly on the private place, in terms of insurance, in terms of coverage, I think a lot more needs to be done, a lot more incentives you need to be in place. And finally, when you think about med devices, right, you start thinking that we are the fourth largest market in India today. Sorry, we are the fourth largest market in the world today. We are still a net importer of devices. And with 100% FBI, with PLI, uh, and probably with dedicated medical paths. I think those are steps in the right direction. But still, I do believe to make this affordable, make this pervasive, a lot more needs to be done. So as, as I just wanted to point out on the back of these four trends, you would realize that the question is not whether innovation is happening. I think these four mega trends clearly suggest that phase one of innovation, the modern level of innovation has already happened. I think the question is, how will the legacy players and how will the government partner with the new age trends, these mega trends, and create value for this healthcare delivery system? I think that is the big question on the table because innovation clearly is going to happen given the scale at which we want to deliver healthcare. And with that, I think uh, with my panel, I'd like to open their to, to their point of view. I'd love to know about you know what they think about you know some of the mega trends, the tailwinds in each of their subsectors. I'd love to understand what they believe is going to be the levels of innovations that they would like to activate and create value, not just for themselves, but also for the healthcare industry. So with that, uh, may I just start with uh, you, Santosh, uh, in terms of please sharing your point of view. Uh, thank you, Anmol. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure and privilege to be here this evening amongst uh, industry experts and my fellow panelists. Uh, like you rightly touched upon, COVID-19 has asked many questions from the healthcare industry, especially from the provider space. Traditionally, healthcare providers unfortunately have been laggards as far as use of digitization and technology goes. As far as medical technology, yes, you know, we've always been at the forefront. But in terms of actual use of digitization or digital health, I think providers have been laggards. Pre-pandemic, a hospital like ours or any nursery healthcare hospital was doing about 2 to 3 percent of their concerns as e concerns. But now, post pandemic, a good 12 to 15 percent of our concerns have become e concerns. So, that is one big change that we have seen. Clearly, what the pandemic has done has accelerated the adoption of digital health. And this is a behavior that I think is here to stay. And the good part is both the doctors as well as the patients have adapted very quickly to this and institutions have been able to invest in technology to make sure that we are able to take it to the next level. As we move forward, I think technology and innovation are going to play a very key role in diagnosis, in treatment as well as in accessibility of healthcare. Today we are working with companies like, uh, you know, which are making CT scan machines with the AI and machine learning, which are actually able to identify scans of tuberculosis patients of COVID-19 patients. Today, there are digital pathology companies which are actually able to pick out through slides, through digital pathology images, the cancer 
diagnosis and the level and stage of cancer. What this is doing is that resources like pathologists, resources like histopathologists, resources like radiologists are very scarce in a country like ours. But using these technologies, I think these resources can be more effectively and efficiently used. Today we are working with monitors which are in ICUs which are actually able to predict the risk of stroke, risk of impending heart attacks. Again, critical care nursing is a huge shortage in our country. Using technology, we can make sure that we are actually able to use these resources more effectively. As far as technology towards treatment goes, we are of course moving to the next level, robotics in surgery, robotics in rehab services, robotics in orthopedics. There are a number of robotics-based services that have come in which are going to help to take healthcare to the next level, to make it less risky, to make length of stay shorter and overall improve the outcomes. The other very important thing that I am very excited about personally is the use of digitization and innovation to take healthcare into tier 2 towns and cities. I think that I think is going to be the biggest benefit of using digitization. Today, we have, as, a, as an institution, we have set up small cancer centers in cities like Akola, Sholapur, Gondia. These are tier 2 or tier 3 cities which did not have linear accelerators. But as an institution, we have gone and set up these centers and the treatment that is provided, all the planning is done at our flagship hospital in Mumbai and all the plans are transferred to these tier 2, tier 3 towns. So we are able to provide care in these cities at the level that you would get in a city like Mumbai. And that I think is the biggest advantage, the biggest leverage that we must use technology for. How do we make it more equitable, more accessible? So overall, I think technology is going to play a key role in diagnosis, treatment, making care more safer, but more importantly, more accessible and more equitable. Thank you. Thank you, Santosh. That, you know, we've been chatting and Santosh gets me so excited, you know, in terms of he's a provider at MedTech. We have a symbiotic relationship here. Uh, I'll just say, first of all, congratulations and thank you to all the healthcare leaders in the room for really elevating the profile of healthcare in India over the last two, two and a half years and for raising the bar. You elevated it to a profile of a, almost like a national security issue. So, uh, so thank you for that. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, things that um, really get me excited are, number one, there's this tremendous work to do on both on the communicable side, disease standpoint, but also the non-communicable disease standpoint. Cancers are on the rise in India, uh, cardiovascular conditions on the rise, diabetes is on the rise, arthritis, the arthritis is on the rise. We can go on and on. So the disease burden is immense. So that's one. Number two, if you think about the demand side of it, the demand side of it in terms of the payers. Ayushman Bharat, you know, we all have different opinions on uh, where it needs to be, but the fact of the matter is that it, the kind of coverage it has provided over the last couple of years has, is, is commendable. That along with the private insurance, if you think about it, the, the, last year was the first time that the retail private insurance overshot corporate private insurance. So the demand, it, it, it's just fueling the demand. Ayushman Bharat also continues to look at rate expansion, coverage expansion, different formulas you know, for reimbursement. So payers are also fueling demand, both private as well as public. And then what's fueling demand is infrastructure. You know, all Indian Institute of Medical, whether you take the pinnacle on the public side and the all Indian Institute of Medical Sciences, you'll have 24 all Indian Institute of Medical Sciences, most of them, almost all of them, the new ones, in tier two towns and cities. Then you have almost 70 plus district hospitals getting converted to medical colleges. You have institutions, even on the private side, whether it's you, Santosh, your institution, or any other institution that is looking into tier 2 expansion. All that is fueling demand. So that, and then, you know, from a supply standpoint, I also see that the government is putting its might behind manufacturing initiatives. So the PLI schemes that are coming up, the medtech parks uh, that are getting uh, stood up, you know, with Andhra and now four other medtech parks, all of that. Uh, you know, makes, gives me a lot of confidence that we are on the right path. We are growing around 
or so Kager as MedTech, but there's so much more room to grow here. Uh, and, that, and then the biggest thing around growth or the confidence in the industry is the policy part. And I'm seeing that the medical device regulation is creating frameworks that will help provide some stability and will bring discipline to the growth of this industry. So those things get me very excited. But I also see opportunities uh, ahead of us. Uh, the first is how do we go from a make in India to innovate in India. Uh, make in India is good from a volume perspective and we've proven this out with automobiles, electronics, uh, etc. Right? But how do you now start getting into innovate in India? So that's one. The second thing that I see as the biggest opportunity for us is really how do you elevate as an industry to global quality standards. Global quality standards on education, yes, there are medical colleges that are getting converted in Bhilwara, in Kota, and other places. How do you elevate the quality of caregivers? How do you bring specialist care to tier two? How do you elevate the quality of products that are being made in India to global standards? Yes, we can have a segmented, segmented strategy in India. But nevertheless, you have to meet certain global thresholds on quality. If we want to become a net exporter of products, there's also medical value tourism if you want to attract that as well. So I see that as a big one. And I, finally, I see the role of the government in terms of going full throttle in not only resourcing innovation, which I, I think it's put some money behind 50,000 crores that have been committed uh, in the National Research Foundation over the next five years, which is wonderful but also sourcing innovation. Today our procurement, if you look at our procurement, it's still L1 for most part. So how do you become, how, do you, how does the government start to source innovation as well, uh, instead of just uh, resourcing innovation. So a uh, very exciting time to be, and as our CEO puts it, our global CEO just mentioned this, we will see in our, and we are so fortunate in this room, because we will see over the next 10 years, more transformation in healthcare that has happened over the last century. So I just want to say, you know, uh, congratulations to everyone here in the room and a big thank you. Fantastic, thank you, Sadeep. Dr. Madhun Gopal, purely from NDIO's perspective, right, would you also like to share, you know, your point of view on how the government has thought about uh, innovation in healthcare in India and how does it plan to continue on that journey? Thank you everybody for giving this opportunity. As I see, because having uh, witnessed the uh, COVID management uh, pretty closely, I can say that uh, if we don't invest in innovation during the time of crisis, and if you don't use the technology, then we can't sustain the efforts which we are making. I will just cite an example how things have innovated, uh, and how, how we have invested into innovation for seeing uh, for managing the COVID pandemic. When we started, when the COVID pandemic started, you might have seen that uh, we used to import the COVID thing and Kanchamraji is there. We used to import the uh, diagnostic kits and you see how the challenge was made, uh, as you have rightly mentioned, the make in India. So we have done that thing. But to facilitate that, is previously there was only one lab, now we are having four labs which can validate the kits. As a result, now we are self-sufficient in diagnostic kits and now and the cost of the COVID test have also come down. It is because of innovation and promotion of the local Make in India concept. As a result, the dependence on the, the imports and other things have come down and we have seen that the testing has become very rampant. Now, it's very deep. now in the home care also you are having, a, you can do a COVID test in the home. We have evolved from Importing the diagnostic kits for COVID, now you can do test yourself and find that you are positive or negative. That kind of thing have evolved during the last two and a half years. Having said this, you see that how we have leveraged the technology during this COVID times. One of the important things which was uh, uh, before the COVID was teleconsultation, telemedicine and other things in the public parlay was not legal. Honorable courts have taken cognizance of that. They have passed against orders against the doctors. 
this was an opportunity because as I mentioned in the earlier sentence that we, if during the time of crisis, if we don't uh, take that as an opportunity, we took this as an opportunity because when lockdown was there, there were many patients who were requiring follow-up. How to provide care to this patient, that was the challenge which we were having. Regarding the COVID patient, the hospitals were taken up and beds were reserved for them. But what to do with the patient because as we all are aware that NCDs is a big problem and there are many people who require constant follow-up. That was an opportune movement and the telemedicine guidelines were released. Now, as the things are maturing, you will see that how the guidelines will evolve and more precision will be added to the guidelines. But that has opened a big industry for uh, teleconsultation, teleguidelines and other things during the time of crisis. Another important challenge which uh, was there uh, when, we, when the vaccination things were started, as usual we have also approached the western countries asking about that ki weather and how quickly we can get the vaccine. The reply was that ki if you place order during the last quarter of 19, last quarter of 2020, you will get supplies during this quarter of 22. As a result, uh, efforts were started uh, to produce an indigenous vaccine. And, and fortunately, we could, uh, by use of the different methods which were available, we could culture the virus and now that the history is there. And the another important innovation which you have seen, we were having the e-vaccine platform, e-win platform we used to call, that was used traditionally for the uh, logistics management of the ongoing uh, routine immunization. That was, uh, that platform was available, that was updated and now we have seen how the COVID platform can beautifully write from beneficiary engagement, session management, logistics management as well as certificate generation. You see that how the things have progressed and that technology is available, it's a, a good which is available and we are we are seeing that how we can give this public good to the rest of the world. We have evolved and got it matured to that level. The other use of the technology you have seen that the interaction with the state. During the first pandemic, uh, that is the H1N1, I have also witnessed the pandemic. Uh, at that time, the coordination with, our, with the states was very difficult. Here now you have seen, you have, everybody is now using uh, uh, the platforms the Zoom platform, the Skype platform, the other platforms. In fact, if you look at the how the TV channels also have adopted to the, the use of this platform, it was very easy to give interviews for three to four channels in a day because you are sitting in the office half an hour, 40 minutes and your interview is for each. That kind of ease it has given. That's a different part. But in the medical parlay, as you have mentioned, in the national health policy we have, having an intent of uh, doing innovation. In the innovation at NITI, we are having a innovation mission which we are supporting the startups and the uh, incubators uh, on a challenge board that is happening. In the health also, in the support of others, we are trying to find out solutions for few of the problems, particularly in the medical device sector that is there. You have mentioned most of the thing, the PLI scheme is there because we are dependent so much on the APIs for in the pharma sector. We have to promote how the indigenous production of APIs can happen. That's the challenge which are there. The medical devices, can't we have medical devices? There was a question saying that we make in India medical devices. So where are the standards? So we are, we are having Bureau of Indian Standards and around 1400 plus uh, devices, they meet the standards. Now, whole of the world can see that we are having a standard product. So that kind of Things are happening in that direction and uh, in future you will be seeing more of that kind of things. A lot of, you know, without, if you are not innovating, if you are not uh, using technology, you can't sustain the changes which are happening so fast in this world. You have to keep pace with the changing world and adopt technology and innovate. Unless you innovate and try to find out the solution for a particular problem is very, very difficult. Uh, just to close before that, before closing, I would say that uh, if you look at the TV program, previously private and the government uh, information was not shared. After the Nishche platform, now you see the compliance of the TV. Otherwise, uh, the one study which we did uh, uh, in 2019, 
We have found that uh, for a patient of TB to get a proper treatment in tier 1 city, he has to visit at least 8 10 providers to reach to the proper person. But that kind of thing has been addressed with the use of this digital platform and other things. And similar kind of innovations are happening. And uh, as a, in the course of discussion, we can share uh, some questions there. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Oh, you know, coming to you, um, I think as you share, you know, your view on the vision of healthcare, I think a great question to also be answering is because of COVID uh, trend of more diagnostics, more perhaps more frequency of you know diagnostics. Do you think that trend is also here to stay? And do you think that trend is here to stay? Um, uh, thank you for having me here. I think uh, if you look at the last two years, FY21 and now 22, the biggest event, which is COVID, uh, has changed the patient cycle. I think to me, if anything has changed from before COVID and after COVID, I hope we are seeing an after COVID stage, uh, is I think the psyche of the person, I think all of can relate to it, has dramatically changed. And I will probably use the word that it's moving from I need healthcare versus to I want healthcare. So it's earlier probably I used to visit a doctor, worry about my health only when I observe something is not right. I don't think in future I am seeing a clear change where people want to take charge of their health. I think everything is being driven from there. And the moment you say that I want to take charge of my healthcare or I want actually proper healthcare for myself, uh, that brings in huge change in what exactly is going to happen in the healthcare ecosystem. I think the first, and probably I will put down a few changes that I am observing are the trends which are the future. One is the size of the market is actually going to go multifold. Population 1.3 billion people. Uh, right now, healthcare is all in big sort of cities, metros. Now it's actually going to go to tier two, tier down. And if you actually put the math together, I am seeing. Definitely one thing to probably note. Uh, second is convenience is becoming extremely important from a patient perspective. And that's a broad theme I can think of. And in that, there is home health is one big idea that I'm, I'm seeing. Uh, we are seeing a lot of home collections requests coming in. And I found the teleconsultation going up. So I actually would put that into a convenience. Uh, in urban areas, even in tier 2, tier 3 towns, people want accessibility of healthcare in a convenient format. That's one big change that I am observing. Uh, second thing that I am observing is again probably related to uh, convenience itself. The lot of business models are going to go on, undergo a change. And with technology being there, now you see at least through e-pharmacy or e-consults, you have many companies that have come into this space which are trying to offer all of these under one roof. And the customer acquisition strategies which used to happen earlier in a brick and mortar system actually is going to undergo a huge change which we are seeing already. Again, that's another example of that you want a convenient access to healthcare. That's, that's on the sort of how you want to access healthcare. The second change that I'm seeing is on, it's not about getting diagnosis done, it's also getting it timely done. Uh, there's, there's no point in actually getting to know the problem at the later stage when you probably can't do much about it. I think that's, that's getting stretched to the early stage where we are seeing a behavior of a preventive health checkups. It's like I would say from being well to well-being is the, is the whole idea. And probably I am even stretching it further where people are very interested in knowing as to what are 
those things which I am at risk of. Uh, so genetic testing or genomics is actually going to become very sort of a, is another trend that I see where people would be very much interested in knowing what are their family history, what are the diseases that run into families, etc. So it's all about, it's not about waiting for that symptom to be observed, wanting to see a doctor, which is probably in the need zone. Now it's moving into a want zone that, listen, I need to take charge of my health. I need to know what are the areas where, where I am more prone because of my genetics or because of my lifestyle. I think people want to take charge of that and I am clearly seeing that trend uh, definitely in urban areas. And from a business perspective, people who are in this whole healthcare system, I think tier 2, tier 3 trauma will see a lot of investments going in, whether from a hospital perspective or diagnostics. I think the last point that I want to really make is, uh, which uh, Dr. Madhur Gopal mentioned about, the working of public and private together is actually going to benefit all of us. And somehow I think this COVID really brought that welcome change the way we work. And we have seen on RT-PCR testing, as Dr. Sahib mentioned about, even this chair also about tuberculosis. There are many examples that we are seeing which are really opening up opportunities for both public and private uh, partnerships to fall in place, where the management of healthcare, especially related to public health, uh, is immensely going to benefit us and I think we are moving in the right direction. You will probably see a lot happening in this area. That's a, probably a fourth trend I would say. I think I'll stop here maybe in the next round of q and I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you. Um, I know may I also request you to you know, share your perspective from our providers, please. After hearing all the solvents here, the entire canvas seems to have been covered. So I don't want to take more time of people and repeat things around. But then what I would like to do is uh, look back. When this forum is about what I read up was about future and innovations of what we can do in future. Uh, what's important is also to look at where we are present and where we have come from in the past. Uh, I come from a very grassroots background in healthcare. It's my 23rd year in the sector. Started off as a trainee with uh, Dr. Devi Shetty and Dr. Roy when they were about to start off Narayan Vidyalaya, Manipal Foundation days. There was no money available, just brick and mortar technology was still a far cry. But then, since 1997, when I'm talking about uh, what we talk about telemedicine today in a big way, the first pilot happened way back in 2001 when uh, we were at Narayan Vidyalaya and uh, ISRO came forward and said, all right, can you guys set up a telemedicine linkage in Karnataka across all the states? We'll provide the bandwidth. Can you provide the medical coverage? And you won't believe, about a year down the line, there were 26 districts of Karnataka and about seven other districts in Northeast, including Tripura, uh, Shillong, and other hospitals were covered by ISRO. And this was covered in a documentary in the Discovery Channel. They did a documentary on this. The Reader's Digest actually did a story on India about how technology was being accessed, being leveraged to access healthcare in remote parts of the country. And we did deliver healthcare around that. And the story was by district in Chamaraj Nagar in Karnataka where about 600 lives were saved in a period of one and a half years of red earning people and the socio-economic cost of it was evaluated. It was a big show at that time. Uh, well, from there, Given the odds, the coverage, everything else, we should have been by now in every small place we should have been there with healthcare. Didn't happen. Didn't happen for various reasons. I think those are points we should deliberate why science and technology and healthcare, in, this is nothing new. Technology has always been there. What is the tipping point that is required for us to be able to deliver that at the grassroots? Uh, like Dr. Manchanda mentioned and others here mentioned that uh, India has different layers to it. India lives in cities and the very large part of India lives in a very different part of the country where you need significant amount of healthcare to deliver. So accessibility still remains a huge concern despite everything that we talk about. I think that's something we really need to develop. 
Uh, I have my colleague here, Dr. Abdul Roy, who has who's done his uh, studies in the US and today he's pioneering EICU. He's setting up about 100 electronic ICUs in rural parts of India, Eastern India. India is one, Eastern India is another country altogether, trust me. We need one bed, three beds for, uh, one bed per thousand in, in, in the country's average. In East India, it's one bed for 3,000 people. So the gap is far, far more. The challenge of actually going down and delivering healthcare there, that's the reality. The day we do that, and those pilots are really working out, I'd love to share as we go forward. And that's where we are also talking about partnering with the government. The PPPs, the COVID times, actually showed a lot of collaboration with the government. And uh, again, uh, there are case studies after case studies, Karnataka, uh, Orissa, in West Bengal, we set up three hospitals for the government of West Bengal and delivered 300 beds each in a stadium. Uh, we took over a 100-year-old shutdown hospital, transformed it uh, within three weeks, delivered patients, uh, healthcare on the ground. Fantastic PPPs we saw. Again, but when COVID went away, the entire initiative seems to have died. Government again went back to its own thing. Private sector has got busy. PPP somewhere seems to have got lost again. Now, can we cast the momentum somewhere? Can this uh, initiative be taken forward? What policies are required to be framed together? And I think firms like yours should come in to facilitate, to make these more permanent in nature than, you know, epidemic-based situation. Third point is affordability. Uh, no brainer. Yashashwini Health Insurance was the precursor to this. Fortunate to have been a part of it when we started off. 40 lakh farmers were insured with 5 rupees uh, from their produce that they used to sell at that point of time. Luckily, Karnataka was a state again which had 26 private medical colleges with excess capacity. Same idea became bigger and bigger today. Uh, Ayushman Bharat is a reality. In Bengal, it's called Sishu Sati. Uh, every state has its own scheme. But the private hospitals are very happy about it today. The bigger ones, well, that's a question that needs to be asked because what has happened is our costs have increased. Uh, we are all buying new robots. We are all buying new technology. We are all uh, trying to become a better hospital, which means cost is increasing. But the revenues are going down, uh, and, and so are the pricing. Now, how does the new industry deal with this cost analysis? How do we? Uh, conserve our, how efficient can we become? All these while, hospitals have, I'm from a healthcare sector, hospitals, but we took our customers for granted, to be honest. We thought there's never going to be a dearth of customers, patients will anyways come to us. But today the customer has a choice, and it's an enlightened customer. So we're seeing a lot of digitization happening where, how do you retain customers? What extra mile do we need to deliver to ensure that this person does go off to many every month? We never thought of this all these years. To me, these three or four things, where digital connect will make a paradigm shift. We'll catch up more of this. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, you know. I think with that, uh, I mean, some great perspectives, but also this begets a few questions that I need to ask. For um, I'm going to try and ask pointed questions, but I would welcome all panelists to share their point of view if you want to add on. Uh, Sadiq, I want to start with you. Right? I think in terms of enablement, I think MedTech sits right you know, in the center of this delivery you know, framework, if you will. I want to understand from you specifically, and it'd be great if everybody can know, digital-led transformation for medtech. What does it mean? Digital for medtech? Yes. Okay. So that's a loaded question. We have the so, whole day. Well, the only reason I ask is because as you sit in the center, yes. there's going to be a lot of digital enablement in terms of playing the ecosystem. Yes. So absolutely. So let's, let's start with digital enablement. Let's start with the patient. So digital for patient means, which has been touched earlier, is the awareness piece of it. As we are shifting to a non-communicable disease burden, how do we increase the awareness of our patients to find out early indicators of those disease states? When do you need to go to a physician to seek intervention? Whether you're sitting on early stages of cancer, whether you have cardiovascular conditions, etc. So the role of digital for medtech is also creating that funnel uh, by increasing patient awareness. So I'll start there. That's from a demand standpoint. The role of digital uh, also from a capacity enhancement. I'll talk about skill enhancement. Uh, you know, we, we've had as JJ two, two physical institutes in India. And we've trained about 3 lakh surgeons over the last 30 years or so. Every year we could touch a couple of 
hundred, maybe three, uh, two, three thousand, four thousand surgeons. Since COVID started, every year now, using a hybrid format of physical and digital, we are able to touch at least twenty-five to thirty thousand surgeons in a year, and we are connecting them globally. So that's how you're increasing skill, building skill capacity using digital hybrid formats. The other innovation I'm seeing in digital is around supply chain innovation. To get the products from point A to point B, and especially as you now starting to get into tier two cities, tier three cities, you have a dealer, sub dealer, sub dealer in a chole wala, and you have diversion of products, you have counterfeit products that creep in into the system, and you just have increased costs as well, and the delay in getting the products on time. So I think this is where digital plays a tremendous role in terms of delivering an efficient supply chain, uh, where you're reducing costs, you're uh, improving the authenticity of the product flow, and you're increasing the timeliness of your product flow as well. So you have the digital transformation there as well. And of course, from a product standpoint, which is the most exciting part of medtech, is using digital in terms of. Today, our medical device products only are used, in, like for example, my products are used intraoperatively. But imagine the product with a technology component where the surgeon uses it to plan the operation better, to personalize the operation based on data and insights. Intraoperative has clinical decision making guidance based on patient parameters and has post-op patient monitoring. So I think the role of digital. Creating a connected care for the patient is immense. So I, you know, this I think we are going to open a whole new frontier. Frankly, unknown. That's why I say the next ten years for medtech or for healthcare are going to be so consequential that we wouldn't have seen that amount of transformation and change in the last century. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, and I think that was a great perspective in terms of how product, how your entire supply chain. How demand generation, as well as in terms of you know your your own ops, right, to serve the consumers better. Is one of one of them are going to be transformed by this. That was a great perspective. Um, Doctor Madan Gopal, right? I just wanted to you know kind of uh, get your view. I think Sandeep touched upon when he was giving his point of view, saying that we understand today there are some legacy challenges in terms of the overall you know workforce, uh, specifically in the healthcare sector today. Uh, there is going to be a conversation around not just the overall quantum, but also around skills, right? In terms of the point of view that you know, media you may have today or going forward, some of the things you may have deliberated. How do you think you know uh, the government is looking at solving this challenge, whether in a PPP mode, you know, or a self mode uh, of introducing greater skill, introducing greater talent in India? Thanks, and more. There are two parts to this question. One part is saying that how we are leveraging the technology for addressing the HR challenges. One of the things which we have mentioned, I have mentioned in my opening remark, saying that the, how the telemedicine guidelines they have made a leapfrog into the uh, leapfrog and changed the way the market behaves. So it has changed. The change is not going to come back. So we have leveraged on that, and now you see that uh, the government is having their own platform, that is e-surgery platform for. Providing uh, consultation, uh, consultation to the beneficiaries at the PNC level and the other issue, other issue. Second thing is uh, during the COVID times, uh, uh, the technology was used in building capacities because uh, you see how the how we could manage uh, the the treatment protocol which was devised at Center for Excellence at All India Institute, and the same kind of uh, knowledge was imparted to all the doctors. Right up to the uh, community health center. That means to the way because a lot of models are there. We are having an icon platform for developing capacities of the people uh, or for the functionaries. Apart from that, you have rightly mentioned we do have uh, we all are aware about the the Aishwarya Bharat PMJ program. But there is another component, another pillar of Aishwarya Bharat. When the Aishwarya Bharat was launched, so there were two pillars. One pillar was. Uh, Taking care of the secondary and the tertiary care, which we all are aware, that is PMJ. But importantly, the other pillar that is uh, that takes care of primary primary health care, that is preventive, promotive, and the other services, 
that was uh, known as Aishman Bharat Health Care Wellness Center. We do have a network of around uh, 170,000 uh, sub center which are upgraded into, which are in a based manner, would be upgraded into Health Care Wellness Center. Here comes the use of the technology because uh, one of the elements there is use of the technology so that the the specialist services because uh, we can't be having specialists at the uh, sub this health and wellness center which usually have a population of 5000 to 10000 population at this population if you want specialist services you do have uh, enablement in the form of uh, community health or officer CHO is there which, which in the common parlay is known as middle level service provider and the other staffs are there the staffs are there to execute the directions given through the telemedicine that kind of enablement has happened. Capacity building programs are in place and they are happening. Now in the coming days you will be seeing more of such kind of innovations so that the access to the specialist services are also being in place. That kind of models are there, implementing it. So that challenges are being taken care of. So the other question which you have asked, the second part, can you repeat that? Sorry, sorry. I, no, no, please. I think I just wanted to know, uh, you know, what would be your point of view in terms of institutionalizing these programs? Or, or okay, what important. It, it. Sorry. Uh, one of the important things we have been talking about is the digital health. One of the challenges about the digital health, not the uptake of the digital health, is bringing practice into the te technology, not the vice versa. You have seen that ki why the technology uptake is not that because you see the telemedicine is there from the early part of 2000 and the, you see uh, the we had a digital vision in 2010-11 about having 1.3 billion electronic health records. We had that vision, vision and when the clinical establishment act was there, that was the vision was there that key, all the institutions which are participating would be having electronic records way back in 10-11. Then after that to enable that the government has named a, a CDEC, CDEC Pune as a nodal agency for providing software to the hospital as well as got license for standardizing all the uh, data points which will be coming, data information sources. The Snowman City license was there, no, none, nowhere in the world that has happened. But we have started our journey from there. Now you see that uh, you name any program, you are having a dashboard. One of the challenges integrating all these dashboards. Now you see that how the integration is happening. We, uh, the, the ministry has developed a integrated health information platform in which all the program would eventually be loading on that. And so with a common identifier, all the programs will be talking to each other. So we are moving in that direction. So DKC issues are there, but we are moving in the direction. You will be seeing more changes in the coming days. Thank you, sir. Oh, you know, one of the topics that we discussed right, offline was that private equity in healthcare in general right, uh, is a big driver of transformation. Right? Uh, I just wanted to hear your point of view. How do you think, and last year was some great examples in terms of the overall investment. Going forward, what role do you think private equity will continue to play in transforming healthcare services delivery uh, in India? So as a part of my job, I meet a lot of these investors, both uh, private as well as public. Uh, see, you must see from an investor's perspective is that it's a capital which has to generate returns. And it has to compete with any other sector. It's not just only meant for healthcare. So at any point in time, these people are looking at if I have X amount of funds, how do I deploy in various sectors? So I think what is very important is to see that uh, what is the return on capital which these people have. And you must have seen that it's not the entire gamut of healthcare which is attracting investments. And only certain parts of healthcare are uh, attracting investment. Diagnostic happens to be one of them. So I think they, they look at the businesses which are asset lights, uh, they look at where the return on capital employed is better than the others. Uh, of course, there are certain impact funds which are looking at allocating certain funds to healthcare. So, my short answer would be uh, as I just mentioned in my opening comments, the healthcare in general is, is now a growing sector. 
lot of innovations are happening, a lot of disruptions are happening, especially on health tech side. Uh, so a lot of investments are coming towards uh, health tech or new business models where we have seen many companies coming into e-commerce. So uh, I think uh, next five, ten years, you are going to see a lot of flow of uh, funds coming into healthcare, especially in the models which are new age businesses like teleconsultations, a uh, lot of uh, AI, like artificial intelligence is one area which is becoming a big thing in, in healthcare. Like for example, we have a digital histopathology where, or even teleradiology. Uh, these days, machines can read scans even much better than probably human eyes. So it is not only enhancing the productivity levels of uh, either histopathologists or radiologists, but it's also improving the sort of clinical outcome or, or how you read these scans. So it's probably helping on both. So some of these uh, uh, innovations are attracting a lot of investment. So I, I'm seeing that private equity is chasing those businesses which are uh, which have promise, which are more promising from a future perspective. Well, may I just add a couple of seconds just to add? And, you know, again, because of the work that's going on, all the leaders in healthcare, I think uh, we are seeing a lot of infusion, private equity, and VC money coming in. In fact, it's encouraging to see that our share in healthcare of this money has increased. Last year, first half, $3 billion came in into healthcare in India from this uh, group. Compare that the year before, for the full year, it was $3 billion. So it doubled in just half a year last year. Very encouraging to see. Now, the money continues to flow in the provider space. So a lot of money, first of all, is flowing into pharma. So pharma is getting the bulk of it, 150, uh, so 50% or so is coming into pharma. Then you have the hospitals that are getting it. Medtech is a very small play, and I think that's where there's an opportunity, you know, in diagnostics, medtech, also uh, edtech. Uh, also, startups that are focused on supply chain disruptions, they are starting to get some money there as well. So I really see there's a lot of opportunity beyond pharma and hospitals for the money to start coming in as well. So some proof cases have to be made. So home all the best as you attract capital. Yeah, and I think uh, I've also seen the last three years, uh, there are funds which are only focused on healthcare. And, uh, and probably, uh, Many more are going to come, which are primarily focused on health, healthcare. I think health tech is a very, very big area where the investments are going. So we exist, or I exist here because of private equity. So we left. I'm continuing my story where I left just now. Back in Narayan Ritalia, 2001, five of us came out, and then we thought we should do something on our own. All of us were uh, led by Dr. Roy, who was. Dr. Davies' partner those days, but then none of us were industrialists, none of us were, didn't have backing. So we thought, basic hospital managers, what do you do? So we put up a business plan together, went up to Godakal, Nainital, sat down seven days, came up with a plan, went to Bombay, there was a VC, uh, IVCJ conference happening. In a conference like this, sat in a place, there was a big conference, a lot of people speaking. We identified 10 people, said, all right, we have a business plan. Five of us met. 25 people, four of them, what do you believe, uh, this was 2006, 2007, they came and said, all right, you guys seem to have a good plan, we would like to put money behind you, how much money do you want? We said, all right, 100 crores, and somebody actually wrote us a check within, uh, within, within about three months' time from that business plan, we had 100 crores, and our first hospital started under construction, we did 500 hospital in Calcutta, and uh, since then, we have four of us, today we are about 5,000 people, 10 hospitals, East India. We exist because of private equity. I mean, I want to tell you that. That's, that's the positive part. This was ICIC Ventures. Uh, we just raised, then private equity has, okay, with private equity, it's life and death. Every five years, they will have to exist. So your life starts at five. At the end of fifth year, you're going to figure out how do we give them an exit. How do you bring in the next private equity who will take over? You got to, your responsibility to get them exit is yours. So you can exit at a certain percentage of uh, returns. And 20% IRR is what they would normally expect. 
with the Hindu rate of growth in healthcare revenues, that's a difficult task. All right, so you don't make that much of revenues to generate that kind of return. So then comes the valuation story. Uh, Ms. Manchanda knows about the valuations in diagnostics and the healthcare sector, but every five years to give double your business in terms of valuation becomes a huge challenge. Then we had Quadria Capital, we have Investment Sweat Fund, DEG. Uh, we just raised our last round from Temasek, which is one of the biggest Singapore-based uh, private equity, government private equity fund. Uh, but then, I mean, I'm talking in a light manner. They come in with their, uh, with their exit door open. They start calculating the revenues. How much are they going to make? That they are going to invest money in. So there's a huge amount of pressure. And this pressure, a lot of times, has to be moderated because uh, who pays for it? At the end of the day, it's the customer. The consumer is going to pay. So the balance is very important in terms of how much money do you draw from private equity while, and how much debt do you take, how do you sustain, how much price increase can you do year on year. These are real questions that we've been dealt on a day-to-day -day basis. But yes, private equity has changed the paradigm in healthcare and, and that's a huge thing. Thank you. Absolutely. Oh, this is awesome. Uh, Satosh, I'd just like to you know, get you know, maybe some final remarks from you. Uh, before we open it up for some questions. Uh, so I think a couple of points that came through, uh, you know, Sandeep kept making his point on how healthcare is going to change drastically over the next decade. Dr. Manchanda spoke about, you know, how convenience is becoming so important and the connected care aspect. I think one thing that all of us need to realize is that there has to be some bit of standardization that has to come. You know, when, when we talk that as providers, we realize that a lot of healthcare is not going to move out of hospitals. You know, they are going to move to diagnostic chains, standalone centers, single specialty centers, home care. So hospital space is going to be primarily focused on complex, high-end kind of thing. Now, how do we ensure a seamless flow of information from diagnostic centers to hospitals to labs to home healthcare providers? If you see, well, that is one area where I think a lot of work needs to still go in. Even during the course of the COVID pandemic, you could see lots of reports just floating around on WhatsApp. You know, your COVID-19 report would be sent on WhatsApp, your Aadhaar card would be sent on WhatsApp. But is there a way that we have a connected ecosystem where information flows seamlessly? And that's where I think the Ayushman Bharat Digital Health Mission, I think which the government has set out to, I think it's a wonderful initiative. How do we expedite that? Clearly, one area that a lot of work needs to go in. Second thing is on the skilling part. You know, how do we talk about doctors to use technology? You know, it has to become an integral part of their curriculum. How do we integrate EHR into the medical curriculum so that doctors, when they are passing out, realize the value of digital records? It, it's very, it's going to be very difficult to start introducing them at a much later stage. So that's again another area that I think a lot of work needs to go into, which is skilling, change in the curriculum, and the connected care aspect in terms of the seamless flow of information. Because that I think will be the true connected care. Right now we have islands of excellence, but how do we make sure that it's a seamless flow of information? Thank you so much. I think that's absolutely on the money. Uh, with that, we'd like to open it up for uh, questions for the panel members, please. Either we were really good or really boring. Yeah, you were excellent, uh, by the way. Uh, but there is uh, one question uh, which I think a lot, a lot of uh, panelists uh, didn't uh, speak about. Uh, that yes, two and a half years, uh, a lot of adoption happened. But what are we looking at in the first half of this year? So my question, um, Mr. Makkar, to you. Uh, you say 25 to 30,000 surgeons you train every year, which was substantially higher. But what, what do you see now? Uh, with with uh, COVID uh, uh, reducing the intensity, and that's what is actually happening. You, you, you could see a lot of startups uh, are actually floundering, right? Uh, they are not doing well. They have actually uh, become a problem for the nation per se. 
So what are we looking at? Are we going to continue this way or it's going to be a static uh, or maybe plateau and then take off? What are your views? I think you've touched on, I think, probably the most important question uh, as almost like a capstone question. You know, all these changes have been good and we've all witnessed them from the front seat and are they here to stay? So I'd say that even from a patient awareness perspective which was mentioned, the patient awareness, it, it, there's a heightened awareness which is here to stay. You know, today only 1% of patients that uh, should get obesity surgery are getting obesity surgery. There's heightened awareness around getting more because they were the most vulnerable when COVID hit. Right? And so I think there's overall, I think, increased patient awareness which will stay. In terms of physicians, you know, seeking, let's say, training, skill training, they resorted to digital because the physical training was stopped. But now they've also figured out that there's a merit to not flying from Sholapur to Mumbai or to Chennai for every single training or every single engagement. They figured that out now. Right? Or they've found merit in connecting with Seoul or Bangkok or other centers. So I think they'll there'll be that calibration to the middle, so to speak, right? So there'll be that world that we now exist in where people have been sensitized to the digital world. Businesses have had to be forced to look at new growth avenues. When our businesses were down, and for businesses that were very tier one focused, they saw that the patients were seeking care closer to home. And patients were forced to seek care closer to home. But they realized the convenience factor of they realized for cancer treatments, for 15 chemotherapy sessions or radiotherapy sessions, I don't need to travel from Northeast to Chennai. I can get care closer to home. So some of that will reset permanently. But it's going to be a process. And this is where I think a partnership between the government, industry, every everyone will have to just keep the foot on that accelerator, you know, so that we don't revert far back. Very good question. Uh, I mean, so look, my, I, I am thinking that even if uh, we see the today's discussion, uh, the topic of the discussion, COVID was not there. But if we see the half of the discussion, it has gone on COVID. So my, I, I, I have a simple question that are we obsessed with COVID or we are just, you know, uh, forgetting the core issues of Indian health? Look at uh, as I mentioned, because in, in case of crisis, if you don't innovate and use technology, the efforts which are made that can't sustain. One of the things are revolving around COVID because it has accelerated the efforts and the innovations which we were doing. As I mentioned, that the digital thought process was there right from 2010-11, but it was an impetus and uh, the acceleration started with the launch of the. National Digital Mission and we are all now started talking about that it would be a game changer in the coming days. It has given an uh, impact and uh, impetus to the efforts which we were making in the earlier thing. It's not that earlier also efforts were not made, but it has given an uh, acceleration to the efforts made. No, I, I just want to briefly add, you are absolutely right. What COVID has done is it's moved a lot of things. And you're right, there are a lot of core issues on healthcare. Those core issues got amplified and exposed as you had the epidemic. So by default, the system had to respond. And based on that response today, we have certain learnings, which we know are not, we cannot go back on today. And therefore, I think the panel has reflected really, if you look at the narrative, the panel has reflected that this has brought us to a level from where to go back is going to be counterproductive. And that's the reason perhaps, you know, this two-year epidemic, and frankly, I was locked up for two years, so it definitely, I'm obsessed with it, to be honest. So, that's, that, that's just my two cents. Yeah, hi, good evening. Yeah, hi. Myself, Dr. Roy Jaswa. Uh, this COVID we are talking about, I think uh, the panelists, they have of a very brilliant foresight about what to expect during the next five to ten years and it's all technology and all 
And I would like to say that this virus, this little virus, we can't even see. We have to step back and see what it has done. And the, the guidelines, the standardization of the, uh, the, the treatment protocols, did we follow that? Now that is also very important. Among the discussions we had today, there was one very important aspect which we missed is the human capital. What about the human capital? How are these technologies and the innovations going to matter without the human capital? What are we doing about that human capital? And the standardization of care. Because what I feel the next thing to look forward in healthcare is the clinical outcomes. And the businesses are going to run on the clinical outcomes. The technology is going to take it. But the outcomes which the, our learned or our emancipated uh, customers, the patients are going to ask us. So we have to step back and look at that also. So standardization of the treatment is going to be a very, very big thing and which we have to acknowledge. We just cannot leave it behind. During COVID also, how many studies from India we have been able to assimilate? Because we still are still prescribing doxycycline, ivermectin till this Omicron or the variant which is there. So these are the things which need to be reflected and I would like the panelists, especially the government, who has a big role to play in, in enforcing the guidelines across. Thank you. I think, uh, let that be the last question because we're absolutely out of time. Sure, thank you so much. So, I'll just give you a story, two seconds. What we live in India over here is very, very different from what's actually happened to a majority of the country that is outside the metros, tier 1, tier 2, even tier 3 cities. 60% of the population. Half an hour ago, I got a call. One of our EICUs, lady comes in, has a big heart attack, semi. No access to a, a cat lab. We thrombolize her and say, get her to a cat lab immediately. She's four hours away from the nearest cat lab. Family's too poor to even transfer, she's dead. She was dead half an hour later. We gave her the medicine, she didn't make it. Unfortunately, this is a story that plays out in 80 to 90% of our healthcare delivery in India. We are talking about teleradiology, we are talking about artificial intelligence. What we don't talk about is one of these monitors costs $20,000 per monitor. How are we going to deliver healthcare where it is actually needed? We all live here. 2% of the population over here in this room. We represent less than 2% of the population. 60% of the population. So the question is, how are we innovating to drive care to that 60%, that 70% who has no access to any of the things we just spoke about? Thank you. quite valid because uh, we are talking about the urban, tier 1, tier 2 cities. But if you look at the health structure in the country, over the last uh, many years it has evolved. That means in, for the rural healthcare setup, so you are having, right up to your village level, you are having a worker, health volunteer who have been awarded uh, by WHO for their exemplary work during the COVID times, who are known as ASHA workers. Above them at the section headquarters, sections are at 5,000 and 10,000 population. Depending on, because it, it is based on population now. Previously it used to be 3,000, 5,000. Now they would be catering to this. At the section headquarters, we were having some health centers, which are now upgraded into health and wellness centers. There you are having a health worker male and health worker female. That means uh, they are providing services to 5 to 10 villages, depending on the population they can. Above them is the sector headquarters. You have to understand the structure to appreciate what efforts are being done for providing treatment to the far flung areas. At the sector headquarters, you are having the primary health center where the system, the population comes in first contact with the medical officer. That caters to around 20,000, 30,000 population, catering to around 20, 30 villages. 
and above them is the block headquarters of the community health centers, which caters to one lakh and one lakh fifty thousand, depending on the population. Here comes the specialist services of the government. Above them is the sub district and the district corporate and the medical college, which all we all know. We are aware about the services provided to the urban areas. Urban areas also simple structure is being built up. But to provide emergency services, as you have rightly mentioned, we have 108 services and and the key performance indicator of this 108 services, which are popular emergency medical response initiative, which is happening for the last two decades now. It's around two decades. And Dr. Chauhan is there and he would be elaborating more on that because he looks after that program. So you look at the response thing. It means the ambulance is there and the response time is around 20 minutes or less than 20 minutes. During that time, the patient is shifted to the nearest. That kind of mechanism exists in the urban areas and the rural areas. The only thing, the, the aspect which is to be dealt is the hospitals where they are taken, whether they are having thrombolized facilities or not. And most of the Hospitals which are attached to this emergency medical response initiative, they do have that kind of capacity, otherwise they are taken to the other, other centers where the treatment is possible. That mechanism is there, it is evolving and as some things set up, the numbers also increase. Okay, this mechanism do exist and it is working and it is maturing also. We see. And apart from that, you see the ambulance services of the corporate hospital, ambulance services of the different uh, 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 the companies and other things. And you see the ambulance services of the, uh, the, the government. The government has having two ambulance services, advanced life support system and the basic life support system. And that is based on the population now. For five life population, we are having an advanced life support uh, ambulances. For for uh, catering to one lakh plus population is the basic life support. So that the patient, when the call is easy, he can be transported and the response time has to be less than 20 minutes. That's the parameter which has been set and we, in most of the states, we have been able to adapt to these parameters. I think I'm afraid uh, we are out of time. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to you all for such a warm welcome. You know, I think this was extremely, I'm at least more enlightened than when I walked into this room. So I want to thank you all for sharing you know, your perspective. I hope you all feel the same. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, we'll probably move on to the next session, right? Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Puri. And of course, a uh, big round of applause for all our panelists. Mr. Puri, may I request you and the panelists to please step ahead and give us an opportunity to click all of you in the same frame. May I request all of you to please step forward as uh, we make sure that this is uh, the moment that we capture right there. And of course, uh, once again, I'd like to thank all our audience members for those questions. I'm afraid we won't be able to take any more of them in the live session. But we'll be happy uh, for you to network with our panelists a little later when we break for networking. Of course, this is the time that we want to make sure we get ideas running and more. So thank you once again, panelists, uh, for sharing your views, your experiences with us.